Introduction to the organization of the brain that I'll be describing in more detail in the, the next two sessions. Um, I decided, uh, as, as one should always do, giving these kinds of lectures to Ibahazar a little bit from last time, uh, just to remind people of some some key points that I'm going to be uh, highlighting again today. Um, so. Uh, in this session, I'm going to describe um, the, the thesis that uh, uh, our brains are so deterministically um, organized and, um, and function in a way that, that reduces our capacity to have free will. Um, so the title is, I'm not responsible because, hello? I'm not responsible because um, uh, my brain may in the course of, of uh, today's presentation, I'm going to focus on aspects of neural circuitry that basically are automatic. Uh, we have reflexes. Those reflexes occur uh, even when we're unconscious. Uh, a person with a, a, a lesion of, uh, of the brain that controls voluntary motion, so for example, someone with a stroke who becomes paralyzed and can't voluntarily move an arm or a hand or a finger, uh, when one induces a reflex, that 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 part of that body part moves, moves quite briskly. In fact, more briskly than than a normal person. So it's not that the person is incapacitated from moving that that particular arm or limb. It's because the voluntary uh, will, so to speak, the control of volitional movement has been compromised by uh, the loss of function of part of the cortex. That I'll be describing. So reflexive behavior um, are uh, naturally occurring. Um, they occur both uh, intrinsically, so when the doctor uh, taps your, uh, your knee, you automatically undergo a reflex action, and you have absolutely no control over that movement. And in fact, that movement occurs before you've actually perceived the tapping itself. Um, and I'll show you some of the circuitry involved with that. Uh, although the order is not indicated correctly here, but I'll then describe to you our uh, neural circuits associated with habit and addiction. These are, again, reflexive behavior, so to speak, but not having a more cognitive component to it. Uh, these are things that we do sort of automatically on thinking. Most of you walk the shul, you did not probably have to map out that particular you knew exactly where to go. You didn't have to cogitate about which, which streets to take. It was uh, a habit that you've done many, many times, and thus doesn't require as significant amount of thinking as going to a novel place that you have to, if you don't have a GPS, uh, really have to pay attention to cues and signs in order to get there. Um, and even when you do have a GPS, you need to ignore the voice that tells you the turns and only someone who's conscious and cognitive and aware will actually do that. Um, so we'll talk about uh, the circuits involved with habit and addiction, which is just a, um, uh, an extreme form of habit. Um, we'll then mo move on and talk about illusions, uh, primarily of the visual system, but these are just metaphors for many of our 
cognitive illusion is that uh, uh, Kahneman wrote a, a, a 500 page book recently on thinking fast and slow. And if you want to read up about the hundreds of various cognitive illusions, I recommend that you look at that. Um, so we will look at why we have illusions and how our brains uh, deal with that. After going through all of those examples, I'll then show you examples of disease where parts of the brain are lesioned and our behavior is altered as a result of those um, lesions. And one interpretation of that is that uh, had the lesion not occurred, then that part of the brain would have been responsible, at least in part, large degree, to the behavior itself that are, that's being affected. Finally, if, we, if there's time, and I doubt it, um, we'll talk about the last part, which is the, uh, the real clinker in, in, in this discussion about the absence of free will, where we talk about uh, voluntary actions, conscious awareness, and brain activity. Um, if we don't get to it today, we'll start off with that uh, next time, and it'll be a nice segue into the opposite uh, uh, thesis, which is that we are responsible for our actions. All right, so with that, as a, uh, a description of what I'll be discussing today, let me remind you about some of the things we talked about last time. So here we have, um, and I'm going to use the arrow here uh, uh, to point out various structures. Uh, here is the uh, lateral view of the brain, the cortex. Um, we described last time the fact that much of the brain is associative, that is, it's involved with cognitive function. And there are a few areas of the brain, of course, that are involved primarily with sensory or motor actions, and we'll be discussing um, those today. In particular, we'll be discussing, at least initially, um, uh, the, the motor pathways, the parts of the neural circuit that control the movements of our body parts, um, and that's, of course, a very critical aspect to our daily living and, and, uh, and uh, purposeful living um, in the environment. Wilder Penfield in the late 20s, that is in the 20th century, late 20s and 30s and 40s, um, demonstrated through uh, electrical stimulation on human patients before conducting uh, neurosurgery that the motor cortex that you see illustrated here in the, uh, the frontal lobe and the touch pain cortex that you see illustrated in the postcentral gyrus, just uh, posterior to this red line, which is the central sulcus of the brain, dividing the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe, the FL and PL, that these cortices are organized in, a, in an homunculus. That is, different body parts are represented um, uh, in very topographic way. In other words, uh, you have the face over here, then the tongue and, and face here, then the arms, and then the trunk, and then the legs coming over on the other side. Um, that is not an equal representation. Areas that are specifically geared for lots of different motor activities, like your thumb or your mouth, are overrepresented, even though the muscle mass associated with those are a fraction of what your quadriceps or biceps might be. Those are mildly innovated by activity um, in this part of the motor cortex, whereas the thumb and mouth are overrepresented. So it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence with the muscle that's being controlled, but with the functional aspect of that muscle. One uses the thumb a lot more in very critical ways than one just simply uses the quadriceps, which basically have a single function in, in moving, moving the leg. So, the circuitry associated with different parts of the cortex are highly stereotyped and represented by its specific function. And that occurs in the absence of any, any cognition. It occurs as a result of the developmental sequence that occurs uh, during prenatal and early postnatal life. Um, so these areas of the brain are have this specialized representation, and that's not only true for these areas of the brain, but also for the associative areas of the brain that we'll be discussing in more detail a little bit later on and in, our, in the next, uh, next lecture. All right, so we'll be talking about the motor system, and we'll be talking about the visual system. 
Um, and um, here is the medial view of the brain. So we're just looking at the brain cut down the, in the center. The two hemispheres are connected by this, this axon track here. Um, and we have visual processing back here, a little bit of motor processing back here, a little touch over here. The rest of the brain, again, is associative, involved with cognitive functions where um, we make important decisions. I'll just say for a moment, because it will come up a little bit later in our discussion, this area of brain motor planning is the uh, um, secondary motor area, supplementary motor area. It is involved with um, an interesting set of, of symptoms when it's lesion. Uh, in particular, it leads to the syndrome that many of you might know about called alien hand syndrome, where one has a lesion in this particular area, the contralateral of the other side, an arm or a leg, a person considers that being foreign. You know, they look at it and says, and you say, oh, this is Rifke's arm, it's not my arm. They'll, they'll, they'll look at it and claim that it's a part of someone else that they know, and it was considered foreign uh, and, and not recognizable. And of course, that can lead to a whole set of Seinberg kind of episodes. Um, uh, the other parts of the, this uh, medial aspect of the brain that we'll be talking about is the area here of uh, emotions and emotional memory. This is the singular cortex that I'm putting the arrow over, and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Um, and these will be important in our discussion of uh, goal-directed um, um, and um, emotion, other emotional aspects of, of the things that we do. We'll also be talking about, uh, in, in a little bit, the hypothalamus and the thalamus in regulating a variety of functions, and of course the brainstem uh, that contains large quantities of neuromodulators. Now, I didn't show you this slide last time, so this is a, a view of the brain in, a, in, in the same kind of view that we had in the previous slide, but we're now giving it a three-dimensional quality so one can look at a, a cavity that's located within the brain. Uh, these are called the ventricles. It's the source of cerebral spinal fluid that floats around the extracellular environment uh, of, of the nervous system. Um, so this is both a reservoir and source of the cerebral spinal fluid, and the, the uh, brain structure that surround this part of the brain, uh, this part of the, uh, 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 these cavities, um, consists of a series of structures that we'll be talking in more detail a little bit later on. Uh, the caudate nucleus, which is part of the basal ganglia. Um, the amygdala, which is important in um, uh, adding the uh, fear and pleasure valences to our, um, to our behaviors and the hippocampus, which we'll discuss in more detail in the next session, that is critical for the acquisition of explicit forms of learning, that is, uh, remembering facts and being able to navigate in the world. Um, so those will come up next time. So again, this is a part of, uh, of discussion. So if, if you take home nothing from the next, from the series of lectures that I'm giving, this is the slide to, to remember. And so you can remember. People have asked for some handouts, so if uh, you can just hand them out, I have maybe you can share copies. Um, some of the, the critical uh, slides uh, that I showed last time and, and I'll be showing you today are there. All right, so. There's nothing else that you take home from, from these sessions, it's, it's this slide. And it basically represents, in a schematic form, the nervous system and how it controls all forms of behavior. Right? So we, we locomote, we sense the world, we, we cogitate about the world, <coughs> and we're worried about our survival. And that's, in a nutshell, what our, our brains are designed to do. We also think, we also are creative. Um, and those are usually assigned to the cognitive areas of the brain. But as you notice from the slide, cognitive areas of the brain are not dissociated from the rest of the brain. They are hitched in a very significant way to our sensory systems, to our motor systems, and the system of state. The cognitive system does not work independently of these things, and neither do the other components. So if we're hungry and we're looking for food, we don't go swimming in the pool, we don't play tennis, 
We don't, you know, we, we act and behave in a particular way to satisfy our particular need. We, need. we use our cognitive abilities to then search for food, and we try to stay focused on that. Um, and, and so in that sense, each of these systems is, is hitched in a significant way to the other. So since we all presumably uh, take for granted that our free will, our volitional actions are coming from the cognitive component of the brain, one has to take into account the fact that it's not independent, that it is, it is regulated to a significant degree by these other systems that are, for all intents and purposes, deterministic and automatic. And the question is, how much control do we have over those systems from our cognitive point of view, as opposed to how much do those systems control us? So today's argument will be for the latter, and the next session will be for the former, and then I'll leave it to you to decide who the winner um, is, is likely to be. Uh, and because this is now uh, still in a, a particular state of, of uncertainty, um, the, as I mentioned last time, the preponderance of the interpretation is that we have no free will, that it is an illusion, that it, everything is deterministic. Um, that doesn't sit well with most people, um, and it doesn't sit well with me because it flies in the face of some common sense kinds of things. And the idea is to see what neuroscience has to say about the common sense, as well as looking at the interpretation of experiments that fly in the face of common sense. So let's start our, our now view of the, the neural circuits associated with various aspects of our behavior that are beyond our control. We have no control. And as I mentioned before, this is uh, an example of the level of information known uh, in the uh, beginning of the 20th century by, by Santiago Ramon y Cajal. As I mentioned last time, he's the Sabalaba of neuroscience. And um, he, through his observations, was able to determine a lot of what we know about neural circuits. Um, some of the things, his interpretations, of course, were, were not correct. Um, and I'm not going to go through the things that are wrong on this slide based on what we know already. Uh, but the point is that the overall theme uh, was correct. So here we have a situation where we have um, a peripheral thing. It could be the skin. It could be a muscle. It could be um, a, a joint, and a, a tendon uh, located in the joint. Each of these things has, has a receptor for sensory information that would then come in. So in the muscle case of the muscle, it provides the brain with information about the degree of muscle contraction that that particular muscle is undergoing. So overall, we know where our, our, what our limbs are doing at any given time. If they're not doing the right thing, then we make corrections of that, etc. That information, if it were in your knee, oops, sorry, if that was in your knee, um, that would then be stimulated. This is then an axon of a sensory neuron who um, has this kind of, of structure and organization. The, uh, the activity then flows into the spinal cord where it then makes a rapid synapse, as I described last time, with a, um, another neuron called the motor neuron, which then goes back to the periphery and causes the muscle to contract. That is your characteristic circuit of a reflex. There is a single synapse associated with it. When the doctor, as I said, mentioned, I mentioned before, caps your patella, and induces the reflex, your, your foot is moving before you're consciously aware of the touch or of the fact that the, the leg is moving. That information, however, is conveyed up the spinal cord and eventually to the brain through a polysynaptic, many synapses associated, we don't have to go into the details, to reach the cortex where it reaches a level of consciousness and then you are aware that you've been touched on the knee. But the reflex occurs um, at least uh, almost an order of magnitude faster than your actual perception um, of, that, um, of, of that situation. Now, the descending component, that is to be able to move your limbs or your arms or your hands in a volitional way, those instructions come from the cortical regions that I mentioned before, the motor cortex. It descends, its axon, those axons then descend to the spinal cord, where they then regulate the activity of motor neurons 
to allow your limbs to move. They cause contractions of the appropriate muscles, and you get coordinated movement. Now, once you've decided to move your limb, you move your limb. I mean, at some point, there's no return. You cannot you know, stop the action. You're going to do it, so you do it. You have, if there's a certain amount of time that elapses, you can change your mind, and we're going to be discussing in the third lecture about overriding certain signals that we can uh, make amendations to our movements. But more or less, it's a fixed action. Once you've decided to move, you move. Um, and there's relatively little control over that. So there's a sort of a point of no return once, once things start that you cannot um, uh, uh, change uh, the behavior of the system. Um, so in that sense, uh, once the signal has left the cortex and gone down to the spinal cord, nothing can um, alter um, uh, the, uh, the subsequent behavior. So the control, of course, is taking place somewhere in the cortex. How does that occur? Okay. So the motor control of the motor system is one of the most complex things that have, people are studying in, in the brain, in our brains, in primate brains, in rodent brains, and even in, in the brains, so to speak, of the slug. And the, this type of, 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 of control has a hierarchical organization that, say, starts off with the motor cortex that I described before. I'm going to move my arm, so I move it. But that, the motivation for moving the arm, uh, the, the movement of the arm so it doesn't slap me in the face, but as I'm gesturing now, that, that, that type of movement is regulated by structures as such as the basal ganglia that I'm going to show you in the next slide, and the large structure attached to the brainstem called the cerebellum. I'm not going to talk about these structures, the cerebellum in any great detail. I'm going to focus more on basal ganglia because it is the, the structure that regulates the, both the cognitive, emotional, um, and stereotype actions that uh, we all do, both on, on a motor level as well as a cognitive level. And it is a source for our motivations, for why we do certain things. It is also the source for um, our habits. So habit learning um, is, is uh, focused almost exclusively by the actions taking place in the basal ganglia. Now, the name basal ganglia may not be familiar to most of you, but all of you are familiar with Parkinson's disease. And it's the Parkinson's disease, which is a disease of structures in basal ganglia, that result in the motor deficits, the movement deficits, and the cognitive deficits associated with the disease. So we're going to focus now a little bit on, on that aspect. Um, and that information then flows down into the spinal cord for the final output of motor activity, movement. Uh, but the action takes place in terms of the volitional control only in the motor cortex, and everything else on this slide is purely deterministic and, and, and set. Um, we have no control over those circuits and how those circuits act to any great degree. So let's look at where the basal ganglia is located. So if I just go back to this slide, this dashed line that you see here is now a coronal cut uh, to the section that I'm, I'm just going to show you about the basal ganglia. So imagine we now cut the brain in this plane, like so, and we're going to look at the brain um, from, from the front uh, towards the back. And this is what we see when we have a cut in, in that location. We can see the cortex, the cerebral cortex over here on the surround. We can see the cavities inside the brain called ventricles that I mentioned before. And then the, these colored structures that you see labeled here are parts of basal ganglia. Basal ganglia come in multiple components. The critical ones that we'll be discussing in more detail are the, the ganglia, the, these clusters of, of, of cells that receive directly inputs from various regions of cortex, um, associative, associative as well as motor areas of cortex. And then there are some output areas um, called the ventral tegmental area um, that um, and, and substantia nigra, where these dopamine-containing neurons, those are the ones that are lesioned in Parkinson's, 
modulate the activity that's ongoing within the basal ganglion. So the two structures, to, uh, three structures rather to, to recall in terms of the input ganglia are the chordate nucleus, the putamen, and the nucleus accumbens. Those are just three names that you need to control. These three structures are hooked up to the cortex in very specific loops, right? So there's a specific circuit. They send their axons in various, uh, in various structures and ultimately control the activity of specific parts of cortex. Areas of cortex that we'll be discussing in terms of the control of behavior. What are those areas? Okay, so the putamen is involved with skeletal motor movement, right? The movements of your body parts to initiate movement. So if I'm in a particular situation, there are three motor programs that I might be involved in. I might sit down and play the piano, in which case I do not want to take a posture that's more appropriate <coughs> for the tennis, right? I'm not going to sit down and at the piano and do this. I'm going to sit down and do a particular kind of motor program that's involved with appropriately for playing the piano. If I wanted to play tennis, I'm not going to do this um, as if I were playing the piano. If I were playing piano, I don't want to do bicycle motions. I want to do tennis motions. Selection of those particular programs is done as a consequence of these loops between the cortex and basal ganglia, and in particular between the cognitive loop, that is, I want to do piano playing, and then the skeletal motor loop, which is what I want to do once I start, start the particular action. I want to do piano motions and not bicycle riding. So these are our more or less what the function of the basal ganglia are. They are designed to initiate a program of movement <coughs> that you volitionally want to do, after which it is done more or less um, without significant cognitive control. Yes, you're playing the piano, you can stop playing the piano. If you make a mistake, you can stop and recognize that. Yeah, so there are, multiple, there are multiple ways in which the behavior could be changed, but this is the basic role of the, of the basal ganglia is to generate and initiate programs of motion appropriate for the situation. And it's done that, and the way it does that is through these loops. In the case of the putamen, it controls the motion for initiating piano playing. For the cognitive, it's selecting the piano playing, and so that conjures up a specific uh, set of, of things. If you're doing a performance in, at Carnegie Hall, you might get emotionally involved in your playing, and that would require the limbic system uh, and, and the nucleus accumbens. So all of these structures then get, are co-activated in some form or another, the balance being dependent on the situation, and then this then would then regulate our motor activity, appropriate for the situation. If there are then lesions in basal ganglia, in case of Parkinson's, you can't initiate any motion you have um, a certain level of, of, of uh, and once you initiate them, they're very slow and they're very uh, uh, fractured and painful. So th those are the general functions of the, um, of the system. And the way this works is that these areas that I've highlighted here um, uh, in, in the various colors that are labeled um, then project to those particular nuclei. So for example, in the cognitive loop, the frontal lobe is the major component. It then projects to um, the head of the chordate, which is the, the chordate nucleus more towards the, the front of the head. Uh, if you want to make eye movements, which are critical, it's, the, it's the, uh, a more posterior part of the chordate. If you're moving body parts in, in a various uh, uh, pattern set, it's the, it's the cutaneum that's involved. If you're emotionally involved with those, those actions, the nucleus accumbens gets recruited. Um, and these are then recruited by the, the indicated areas of the brain. And this then represents the circuit. The circuit is the cortex, the basal ganglia, back to thalamus, and then back to cortex. And it's this loop that informs the cortex what you're doing, uh, how to do it, and to maintain it until further notice. Um, and again, all of this circuitry is, is already preordained, and that is what its function is to do. And 
at the level of, of the specifics, we have virtually no control um, over those actions. So each of these loops then represents um, a, a, a parallel path. Each of them may be co-activated under different circumstances. What happens when uh, we form habits, when we do things first cognitively aware of what we're doing, and then eventually we um, um, become habituated. So here are definitions of what um, habit or addictive behavior um, um, are considered. Uh, habits are sequential, repetitive forms of behavior evoked by either external signals and the outside world, or internally, as you, as you think, for example, um, that once, once they are set, they go to completion without much conscious oversight. In other words, we do them without cogitating about, you know, what's, our, what's my next step? Uh, when you sit down and play the piano, and you play the piece, and you've practiced enough, um, it flows without having to, 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 to fetch out every note. Um, and of course, it allows you to get the kind of um, Addiction is, is a habit um, that has gone to, uh, to a, an obsession level. Um, and, and as a result of that, one's behavior becomes uh, emotionally and goal-motivated, goal-directed, tied to, uh, to the, uh, the drug of abuse. Um, and as a result of that, you start, you know, you can't live without something, and then uh, that leads to a, obsessive kinds of behavior. So the criminal might say, um, I did, you know, I, I stole the money because I needed it to buy, I need to buy drugs. So, uh, so these are our conditions, obviously, that affect us, and how those uh, things uh, affect the systems that I've been talking about um, are, are, are uh, arise from a shift from the cognitive control of behavior of basal ganglia to the more uh, skeletal motor aspect. In other words, it takes initially a cognitive action and makes it reflexive so that it does not require any significant cognitive um, oversight. Um, and this happens as a result of a plasticity of changes in the brain uh, that I will be discussing in more detail um, in the third uh, in next week's uh, session. Um, so just leaving off the, the mechanism of that shift in moving from the cognitive awareness of our actions to a more reflexive uh, awareness of our actions. And what about a habit and addiction? Well, so these, this is a sort of a complex uh, slide showing where the various parts in the brain are associated with um, uh, acquisition of, of you know, a reward or motivate, motiv motivated behavior. Um, it's a complex circuitry, um, and that circuitry is, is illustrated in a schematic way over here. And the, the convergence of all of this, of this circuitry is on two of the nuclei of the basal ganglia, the nucleus accumbens, which was part of that limbic loop, the emotional loop um, of basal ganglia, and the ventral tegmental area, which contains specifically the dopamine neurons. Dopamine, of course, is the transmitter that's critically involved with, with mood and, and, and goal-oriented behavior, and it's the level of dopamine secretion and, and the activity of these neurons that are critical for um, uh, giving you that good feeling, that feeling of reward um, after doing X, whatever X might be. It could be an accomplishment, doing well on an exam. That, that feeling of goodness that one gets uh, with an accomplishment, for example, is mediated as a result of the secretion of dopamine, the action of dopamine. Um, and the dopamine release from the ventral tegmental area um, is regulated by frontal cortex, uh, the amygdala that I'll talk about later, the hippocampus, the hypothalamus, um, all of these areas that are involved with um, uh, uh, limbic and homeostasis and survival also influence the activity of, of these dopamine nodes. So for an example, if one were doing a particular task where one gets a, a reward, initially the activity of these neurons is very high. But after, after you're getting the same praise for the same act, after a while, you know, first of all, the feeling of, of goodness goes away, and, and the praise no longer does anything for you. 
that's correlated with a significant drop in the activity of these dopamine neurons. So the, 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 the change in the dopamine released by these neurons modulate the activity of the motor system in such a way that, and, and the cognitive system in such a way that we become habituated, we, we, be, we have to form habits uh, uh, to the, act, the actions that we've been doing repeatedly uh, over time. So how does drugs of abuse work? The drugs of abuse work by altering the way dopamine is secreted uh, uh, from this area. And this is sort of illustrated in, in this uh, uh, bottom panel here on the lower right, uh, telling, showing you where stimulants, for example, like methamphetamines, uh, increase the release of dopamine by acting directly on the synapses, the dopamine synapses. Um, opioids, uh, uh, rather cannabinoids, uh, pot, uh, which depresses um, uh, motivation, uh, works by reducing the activity in the nucleus accumbens. Um, nicotine does various positive actions that uh, cause the increase in dopamine release. So drugs of abuse all modulate the, uh, the actions of dopamine on the particular structures to the point where that activation no longer is evoked because it's formed a habit. So you, you reduce dopamine release after you've had uh, cocaine for, uh, for months, and the only way to get that good feeling is to now up your, your, your cocaine use so that you can get the right amount of dopamine release. So one's behavior then becomes hitched to action on chemicals within the brain that are required for habit form, for goal-directed um, activities. Once those goals are muted as, as a result of a variety of the things we just discussed, in order to get to that level, you always have to increase the, the level of, 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 acti of, of, of activation. If you don't have enough money to do that, you go out and steal it, because that's what you need to do. Now, as we'll talk about in our next session, these activities, of course, can be reversed. One can, you know, get, get help. You know, one, one can have regret in terms of what one's actions are. Um, and that tends to be something extremely human, and it's that aspect that we need to then consider uh, in flipping the, the question from being not responsible to being responsible. Um, and so we will await that discussion uh, the next time. The next thing I want to take, uh, take you just through very briefly to the actions of, of, of fear response, right? If we see something fearful, uh, we undergo a very stereotype set of behaviors that we cannot control generally. Uh, and that's simply because if we're afraid of something, we want to either fight it or we want to run away from it. It's a matter of survival. Um, and that aspect is controlled by a structure called the amygdala. It's in the medial part of the temporal lobe, um, and it's illustrated here in red. So let's look at what happens when one undergoes a fear fearful response and leads to the activation of the amygdala. Well, the amygdala itself has a large number of, of uh, projections, that is, their axons project to various parts of the brain, and they evoke a whole series of responses from sympathetic, the autonomic nervous system, that gets activated, the parasympathetic system gets activated, you start breathing heavier, um, you get the activation of dopamine, so you want to to be aroused and start moving your body parts as, as efficiently as possible. Your reflexes go up. Um, in some cases, if you're a deer and you see some lights, you will freeze, which is a, another fear response, so it depends. If you see something fearful, like in a horror movie, your jaw tends to drop. All of these responses are um, fixed action. They are behaviors that are just initiated without our cognitive awareness. They will just happen without any of our control. So large parts of the nervous system and the neural circuit is designed for that. What about the processing of visual information? So here is a, a schematic cross-section of the visual pathway. Here are the eyes, the retina lying in the back of the eye. There's the optic nerve that then projects the information from the eye towards the rest of the brain. 
It has a, a stopover in parts of the brainstem and the thalamus. These are illustrated here in numbers one, two, three, and four. In the case of, of one, two, and three, these are things that we have virtually no control over. Right? This is does not even generally do not does not reach our perception directly. So, for example, if someone should come through the door, if, if some celebrity should come through the door, even though I'm focusing over here, I'll see something that's happening over there, I will give a quick saccade or eye movement to, to the door to see who is there. Um, I may not even know who it is. I don't recognize the person. My eyes are moving even before I actually perceive what, in fact, I'm looking at. That occurs before it even reaches consciousness, and it's done through a connection to a structure in the brainstem called the superior colliculus, which controls eye movements. The, the retina uh, also sends an input to the hypothalamus for entrainment of circadian rhythms. So it, it's always good when you fly to Israel in the first morning to expose yourself to the sun, at least in terms of your, your eyes, to look at the sun, so you can now train yourself for the, for the, for the lag in, in, in time. Uh, accommodation, the, the ability of the pupils to change their, their diameter with a high light or low light, or the lens to change its thickness so you can accommodate the things that are close and the things that are far, are also mediated directly through uh, the output of the retina and are completely not in our control. Um, it happens purely automatically. So significant amount of the output of our eyes of visual information is completely um, deterministic. What about the part that's determined? Well, about 80% or so of our in information from our eyes eventually reaches our, the cortex for visual perception. So how is visual stimuli perceived? And this is what the pathway for visual processing looks like. Um, uh, it is fractionated from the get-go. Um, the, the retina uh, releases all kinds of uh, interesting information. Our eyes are exquisitely sensitive to edges and moving edges. And uh, this part of uh, this part of the of the ret so what I showed you in the previous slide brought you to here, right? That was where, this is where the information eventually first reaches the cortex, right? So for visual perception, for cognitive awareness of the visual world. Then it is now processed through, through all of these brain regions. This side of the visual world is being, what is being processed is things that are moving. So your eyes can, can visualize and identify moving objects. This side of the, of, the, of the area is designed to identify what you're in fact looking at. Right? And as I said, we're specifically and highly uh, sensitive to edges, because edges represent boundaries, boundaries move, so we can, if we follow a moving boundary, we identify something that's moving, a, a, a thing that has edges has a form, and so we will then process that form and then identify and store that particular piece of information. Being very visual, about 40% of our cortex is devoted to the processing of visual information. So how good, really, is our visual information that we receive? So I'm going to show you now a series of, of um, a series of um, illusions and point out a couple of interesting interesting features. How many of you see a vase here? How many of you see two faces looking at each other? How many of you see both of them simultaneously? Or do you see one and then the other? Right. Right. So, so that's, that's just an end. This is a New Yorker cartoon where the wife comes into the motel room and the, one of the people, or, or the vase says, it's not what you think it is. <laughs> so, so that is just a, a joke that I decided to put in another book to make sure people wake up. Uh, so in spite of, in, I'm not going to say in spite of, 
uh, although we have so much circuitry devoted to the processing of information and, and breaking it down and putting it together again, we can still be fooled. And the reason why we can be fooled is because of two specific things. One is we are enslaved to edges. So when you look at that, you look at the edge, and the edge tells you either bonds or either two faces. And that leads you to the other problem. We tend to only be able to pay attention to one thing or another. Now, this is a room with about 50 people or so. You know, I know many of you. I can only look at one of you at a time, or I see you collectively. When I see you collectively, it's like a mass. It's just, it's just an amorphous mass. I can look at Esther, I can look at Joseph, I can look at Leo, I can look at Norman, etc. But as a, as a mass, I see you only as a mass. So, I can, so our, our visual information is processed primarily through the, the filter of being able only to um, attend to relatively few things at a given time. What about some other aspects of illusion? So let's look at, at these uh, optical illusions. And how many of you think this line here is bigger or small, bigger than this one? How many think this line is bigger? Right. How many think this circle is bigger than this one? Or this circle is bigger than this circle? What is it? Right? So to me, this line looks longer and this this circle looks large. Right. How many of you see the triangle here? Do, you, do people see the triangle? How about this one here? Do you see the triangle here? Yes. Is there a triangle there? Yes. Basically, it's a bunch of it's three pac men uh, more or less looking at each other. There is no triangle located here. I'll show you another example of the triangle illusion in a moment. But it, Huh? <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So here I, I, I superimposed the lines, so the lines are exactly the same, and the circle, those orange circles, are exactly the same size. And, and the triangle here disappears when you move the pack, you rotate the pac men. They're no longer facing one another. But if you don't, I, I knew that this particular image of a triangle was a bit schwach. So how about this one? How many of you see the muddy and dubbing, uh, both the white one and the black one? Well, isn't this triangle really sharp? Yeah. Yeah. How about this triangle? The black one. But it's basically a series of open angles and Pac-Man placed in the same position. There is no triangle there. The luminance of this is the same as this. Right? There's, no, there's no line here. Right? So here again, we're enslaved. We're enslaved to, uh, to edges. Our brains are enslaved to edges, and when there's a gap, we mine the gap, and we fill it in. And even though we might we're cognitively aware of the fact that there is no triangle there, we cannot override that illusion. And I'm using just this this type of example as a metaphor, basically for the things that we have difficulty with even at the cognitive level. And again, I recommend the Kahneman book uh, that will describe uh, hundreds of examples of our cognitive illusions um, that we have with respect to lots of things. What I want to do in the next few minutes is briefly go through the arguments from disease about the absence of, 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 of quote, as interpretation of the uh, absence of free will. Um, so here is uh, just another view of the various regions of the brain. Uh, the frontal lobes, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. These are the areas of the brain that have large areas of what's called associative cortex um, that are involved in our cognitive abilities. And some of those things are illustrated um, and for the various uh, uh, regions in, in the appropriate colors. And what I want to talk about now is the suppression of stimulus-induced behavior as a result of lesions to the frontal lobe. And many of you have probably heard of this case. It's the Phineas Gage, who uh, in 1848 had the injury that's illustrated here on this slide. Um, and I will then describe the situation uh, here. He was a foreman um, for a railroad company in Vermont. Uh, 
Um, he was tamping an iron down for whatever job he was doing, and, and he was with uh, explosives, and it exploded. And the iron uh, uh, bar that you saw in the previous slide, and the 43 inches long, and et cetera, uh, shot up skyward and went through his brain um, as indicated here. So that was his, his, his lesion at the time of the accident. Um, it, uh, he, he was blinded on the spot because it right, went right through the, uh, probably the optic nerve uh, coming from, that, uh, from the eye over there. And, um, but he probably did not lose consciousness as a result of this action. And he, there was a doctor on, on site. Uh, his name was John Harlow, and he's being quoted in, in the subsequent paragraphs. Uh, he apparently went over to him and says, I, I have some business for you because of his injury. The next paragraph then describes what his injury was in, in, the, in the terms, but uh, you don't need uh, to use your imagination of what, what happened to his frontal cortex as a result of the tamping iron going through. So John Harlow, the physician uh, mentioned before, then wrote up this case and got several publications, which is what one does in academic medicine. Um, and, um, and there's a, his, here's the quote uh, for the change in behavior that Phineas Gage underwent. So before the accident, he was regarded as the most efficient and capable foreman in their employ. Um, but because his, his behavior changed so radically after the injury, uh, they fired him. They could not give him his place again. Um, and this is now a description of his behavior. He's fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, which was not his custom beforehand, before the lesion, manifesting but little deference for his fellows, impatient of restraint of advice when it conflicts with his desires, pertinaciously obstinate, gee, they wrote really nice words, <laughs> capricious and vacillating, devising many plans of future operations which are no sooner arranged than then they are abandoned. Um, for others appearing more feasible. In this regard, his mind was radically changed so that his friends and acquaintances said that he was, quote, no longer gauge, right? So the implication that, uh, or the interpretation of this was that when those areas of the brain were intact, he could be no, nothing other than gauge, right? So I mean, that's the argument. He was no longer gauged, but when the brain was intact, he was gauged, he had, he had the features of gauge, um, and that this brain, part of the brain, that represented gauge, this is gauge's personality, it's now lesioned and destroyed, he's no longer gauged. I also find this form of argument schwach, and, and we will um, go through some of those arguments uh, when we discuss in the next section. But, this is, this is a major limb, if you will, in the argument for the absence of free will. Let me show you some other lesions that change personality. Um, these are not from uh, Oliver Sacks' books. If you want, want to hear more about these kinds of bizarre uh, behavioral changes in personality, I recommend uh, the series of books written by Oliver Sacks. I chose these three particular conditions because they have recent literary um, uh, discussions in, in books that I, that I happen to have read over the course of the year. Um, Richard Powers, The Echo Maker, uh, was a, a Pulitzer Prize of a couple of years ago. And his, um, the book is primarily about an individual suffering from Capra syndrome, which as you can see from the definition, um, and it, it's a consequence of, of a lesion in the singular gyrus, which is this structure um, which is this structure right over here, um, and this structure has, has significant connections with many areas of cortex, but in particular has a significant area, uh, a series of connections to the parts of the brain where we store information about individuals, their faces, etc. So when you see your mother, right, it evokes, it evokes one set of, of emotions and, and feelings as opposed to um, you know, some stranger, which 
neutral, or someone that you dislike um, uh, 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 significantly. So um, those stampings of, of feelings for individuals is a consequence of the interactions, the, uh, uh, the connections between the singular gyrus and certain areas of the brain that store information, visual information about individuals. So in, in the book, uh, as you read from the quote, uh, a brother and sister have this interaction with one another where the brother was in a serious accident and now considers his sister someone, you're my sister, he recognizes her as a sister, but you're an imposter. You, you can't be my sister, I don't, I don't believe you. Huntington's disease is a disease of the, uh, the basal ganglia, caudate nucleus here. Um, uh, again, it's a genetic disorder uh, that results in a series of cognitive, emotional uh, deficits associated with, uh, with motor function and eventually leads to, uh, mm -hmm. to death. I'm not gonna go into the details. And Ian McEwen, a British writer that many of you know, has a book uh, called Saturday. It's a modern version of, of um, uh, Bloom walking around in, 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 in Dublin by Joyce and Ulysses. Um, but here in this case, it's a neurosurgeon, uh, the day in the life of the neurosurgeon on the date that uh, the U.S. invaded and attacked uh, Iraq. That just happens to be a, a not really important, but, the, but he, he is, he is uh, the surgeon is, is robbed by a, a group of thieves led by someone during, who has the initial stages of Huntington's disease. As a neurosurgeon, he's able to recognize this by the behavior, and that results in a series of, 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 of uh, interactions initiated by the surgeon himself. Um, this particular quote I found interesting and also particularly relevant to our discussion, um, so I leave it uh, to your own. Uh, most of you have heard of Tourette syndrome. Uh, that is one also associated with back basal ganglia dysfunction. And of course, it involves uh, tics of various kinds, uh, including uh, uh, inappropriate motor, and more importantly, and numerously, inappropriate speech. Um, one is interested in, in, in a reading a, a book that I found enormously funny, uh, was Jonathan Lethem's uh, Brooklyn, Motherless Brooklyn. It's about a character named Esrog. Um, I guess that's the Ashkenazi way of saying it. Um, I haven't even figured out why his name is named after the Arab Amina, uh, but he's suffering from Tourette syndrome, and um, this is just, I thought, was the most intriguing quote about, uh, about his self-description um, of the disease. So um, I, I, will pre I did print this out in the handout. I'll, I'll print it out for next time. All right, so I, I have gone over the, uh, so I'll, as I mentioned, I'll talk about volitional control uh, the next, in the next session, <coughs> and lead us to the opposite thesis. So I just, again, I just leave you with, with um, this take-home figure which uh, basically indicates that our nervous system, large portions of our nervous system, even the ones involved with cognitive um, uh, 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 function, are uh, beyond our control, and they do their thing in spite of our uh, active uh, attempts to, um, to combat them uh, and to think otherwise, we just can't get around them. Um, the lesion studies sort of suggest, at least at, at one level, that they are absolutely required for the, for the function that they subserve, and thus its lesion leads to the absence of the function. So the argument is that the presence of the function can only is, 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 is deterministically accounted for by the normal functioning of that structure. I know what the counter-arguments are. We're going to talk about that um, the next time. Sorry, I'm a little bit late, overdue, but thanks for your attention. Yes? You talk very much about the two mechanistic approach. Could you talk a little bit about how you remember and how you think about it? Because that's sort of the precursor to life. Right. So when you talk about habits and piano playing and stuff like that, I don't so you, that's, that's 
I'm going to spend a lot of time on exactly that. Because, okay. Right. Because our motive, I'll just, I don't mean to put you off. I'll look. You know, let's, let's take the classic case. We, we're about to make a decision. We have choice A or choice B. Okay. And, and the presumption is that we choose one or the other based on a whole series of information. That information, some of which is what we remember, some experience or some fact, and how does that then contribute to our selection? How does that occur? How do you all remember that? Yes. So it's, I'm going to talk about it next time. So I'll hold off on, on that. You said you could reverse certain activities, certain habits. That would indicate that, yes, you do have volitional control over your actions. Right. So if we take, um, let me just go go to this slide in its entirety. Um, something that I mentioned before, uh, last time rather, in, in this in this control of behavior is the fact that there's something called reinforcement learning or operant conditioning, whatever whatever term you want to use it. And then one of the things that is highly evolved in us and primates, but other animals have it as well, but we have it sufficiently is that we act in the world, we see how our acts behave in the world, and then we can modify our actions depending on other motivations that we, that we need. Do they fit uh, what we want to do in the world? So yes, once, once we get into a habit of like drug use or something like that, if, if some event occurs or our self-realization, we can reverse those things, and it's that aspect of the reversal um, that, for me, is, is the counter-argument to the discussion about what, um, you know, uh, the absence of free will. Yes, we'll do something, we we'll may do something mechanistically, but we can then reflect on what we've done, and then we can then change what we've done. The question then becomes, is that deterministic, right? So that, be but that, becomes, a that. So that becomes a semantic argument that, you know, aim of the ourself, we can, you know, you can argue over, reiterate over and over again. But right now, I agree with you that that is the counter-argument. And the counter-argument for many things that we do, um, that we can change even in the course of, of the action itself. And I'm going to present actual experiments that demonstrate that fact. So next time, I'm going to start out with the, the classic punch for the absence of consciousness when we make a volitional movement, which is the bizarre, you know, I want to do something, and my brain starts behaving in a way, way before I even am aware that I want to do something. So, so that's how we're going to start with our discussion next time, which is the argument for the absence of free will. How we interpret that, and what it means in the context of the experiments themselves, and what other experiments and illustrations show argue against it is what I'll be uh, presenting next time. So that would mean when the comedian said the devil did it, then that and maybe had some uh, realistic uh, Well, we tend to laugh, but you know, what we laugh at usually has a kernel of truth. It's not a trick question. It's a devil.